Recording in progress. All right, everyone, how are you doing today? Welcome to Class 9, Recording Studio Fundamentals, Spring 2022, Copeland School of Music. Um, we have a lot of stuff to cover today, uh, but where the, or before we do that, um, is there any questions about the assignment from last week? I didn't think it was too difficult, uh, but I just want to make sure that we get these basic things about mixing together. And we're going to continue on with that assignment today for next week as well. Everybody okay so far? We're a little light. People will hopefully show up. I know that one of our class members um, is in the, uh, I think he's in the Army Reserves and he's on duty. So he won't be here today. And then let's see. Hopefully we'll have undergraduates here because it looks like just graduate students so far. All right. Now, last week, oh, there we go. Got an undergraduate student. Sean is here. Great. <laughs> uh, so last week we imported audio and we worked with audio a little bit in Pro Tools, but I didn't really explain anything about digital audio. And in this class, it's not something that I want to go into deeply. I want to give you the basics. You do need to understand the basics. There are plenty of people that work creating music that, <clears throat> excuse me, don't um, know anything about digital audio at all. And so um, whether that's good or bad is another story, but that's sort of the reality of the situation. What you have to realize is that the f basic principle of anything digital is that it is a representation of something using ones and zeros, right? So it's a numerical representation of something. When we hear sound in nature, we're hearing waveforms and you know, waveforms have different shapes. We, I believe we've gone over that. And, um, but we're hearing them as acoustic, natural, analog, meaning no, no conversion into digital. And that is the, the uh, d d data that digital audio is trying to recreate. So digital audio starts off with the word digital, meaning numbers, right? Digits. So let's go to the... Uh, uh, and um, also, uh, all of this material is up on our OneDrop. Uh, OneDrop <laughs> is up on our OneDrive Class 9. Can't believe we're at Class 9 already. All Everything here that we're going to go over today. So you can download that if you want. <clears throat> um, I could just pop this PDF into the chat so you can have access to it pretty quickly. Let me do that right now. There we go. All right. So I'm just, I put this together today. I, I you know, I, from my own words and I copied and pasted from some uh, other websites. I've taught this before. Uh, many times every semester for the past 10 years I've been teaching this, but I, I like to update things uh, every once in a while because I get tired of it and my concepts change as I learn and I grow. I'm still learning a lot about this stuff. I, I've been working, recording audio since all of you were, before all of you were born, I've been recording audio, right? Unless, you know, anybody is 50 years old in the class, which I don't think so. I've been, since I was a young teenager, I was recording, you know, 12, 13 years old, I was recording audio from a cassette deck um, and, and sticking it in front of things and trying to figure out the best way. And when I was a teenager, you know, in, in high school, we ha I was recording stuff in this little studio that we had. So I've been recording things for a long time and I am not by any, I'm not by any means would ever claim that I know everything about it and there's always more to learn, just like there's always more to learn about playing your instrument and writing music and teaching and any endeavor 
that you uh, t- partake, there's always more to learn. Once you feel like you have no more lessons to learn, you should probably stop doing what you're doing because what's the point of it all? Uh, anyway, let's just go through this. There'll be some images, and I've got a session set up to sh- demonstrate some of these things. So digital audio is a technology that is used to record, store, manipulate, generate, and reproduce sound using audio signals that have been encoded in digital form. So an audio signal gets captured, it gets recorded, and it gets encoded or transformed into digital form, meaning ones and zeros. It also refers to this, this is very important, this next paragraph, to the sequence of discrete or individual samples that are taken from an analog audio waveform. Instead of a continuous wave, which is what we hear in nature, digital audio is composed of discrete points, which represent the amplitude or the volume of the waveform approximately. And every one of those discrete points, uh, this is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm adding this, every one of those discrete points is a sample. It's called a sample. So in other words, it's like, you know how you're watching a movie and everything looks like it's happening continuously? Well, a movie is a series of still photographs that move at a certain rate per second. 24 frame, and every one of those photographs is called a frame. So in standard Hollywood movies, 24 frames per second is the standard unfolding of those um, photographs. And that gives you the illusion that the pic- it's moving pictures, right? Television is about 30 frames per second. You also now, uh, with you know everything being done in a digital camera, you can get 60 frames per second, 120 frames per second. Those tend to not those tend to look hyper real, but 24 frames per second are 24 pictures contiguously attached to each other in the span of one second. That's what that means, and that's a lot like audio. So every one of those discrete points is a sample, and those discrete points represent the volume of the waveform the va- amplitude of the waveform, and approximately, and we'll get into why it's approximate a little later on. So the more samples that are taken, so in other words, the more of these discrete points that are captured or the samples, the better the representation, and this impacts the quality of the digital audio. To create a digital audio from an anal- to create digital audio from an analog audio source, source, tens of thousands of samples or snapshots, or each one of these discrete events, right, discrete points, are taken per second to ensure the replication of the waveform. To re- so, in other words, they're taking tens of thousands of snapshots, tens of thousands of, or you could call them samples discrete points of uh, amplitude are taken every second to create the replication of the analog waveform. And each sample represents the intensity or the amplitude or the volume of the waveform, the audio volume in that instant, right? We're going to look at images to uh, reinforce this. Now, these samples are stored in binary form, that's ones and zeros, or zeros and ones, just like any other digital data, regardless or irrespective of the type. Or, as my father used to say in his bad Brooklyn um, Italian jargon, irregardless of the type, (laughs) the samples which are merged into a single data file must be formatted correctly in order for it to be played on a digital player, And today, the most common digital audio format is MP3. So each one of these samples or discrete points that they've captured are merged into a single data file, right? So your data file could have millions and millions of samples in it, depending upon how long it is. 
because in CD quality audio, we have 44,100 samples or snapshots of the audio waveform every second. So when you're, if you, you know, back 10, 15, 20 years ago when CDs were the most commonly, way to, commonly used way to listen to music, when you put a CD, player, CD in the CD player, every second of audio that you're hearing is comprised of 44,100 samples or 44,100 discrete points that they've sampled, 44,100 snapshots of the audio amplitude or the audio volume every second. And that means 10 seconds of audio has 441,000 samples. So you could see how, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you multiply that by um, 10, right? So you've got 100, 100 seconds of audio, you're over four, 4 million samples, right? So that's like a, a minute, 40 seconds. You've got over 4 million samples, almost 4.5 million samples. So you could see how there, it's just a lot of, a lot of binary data. And this 44,100 samples is called the sample rate, right? It, it, it means this is the sample rate. So when you hear somebody say the sample rate is 44.1K, that's what that means. Now, different formats use different sample rate. Most of the music you listen to as audio that's being streamed, that's you buy MP3s or if you buy CDs, not if you buy vinyl, that's different. <laughs> Unless the, you're playing it through a digital uh, amplifier, then that gets converted into digital information. But most of the music that you listen to is, um, has a 44.1K sample rate. Television and films are at 48k. Those are just the industry standards. Don't you know? I could tell you why 44.1 was selected. I, I can I and I will tell you why. Why TV and film are 48? That's I don't really understand the difference, but that's that's the way it is. So if I'm scoring a film, I'm working at 48k. I actually always work at 48k. Um, irrespective of what I'm doing. But you guys should just stay at 44.1. Hold on one sec. All right. Now, this is, this is the, the red is a waveform, right? Now, this is very simple. This is not what, this is, every one of these blue dots represents a sample in this particular example or a snapshot of the audio. And on this graph, from left to right, so it reads like a book, that's time. So from here to here is a certain amount of time. And from here up, or from here down is amplitude or volume when you're looking at a waveform. So if you look here to the left, you'll notice that it's got these numbers. That's Those are representation of volume, whether that's decibels. I'm not sure. I just you know liked the way that this looked to give you the, your first taste of what this is like. So you could see that there's, if this was an analog waveform, it would look like the red line, right? But in digital audio, you've got these little snapshots of this waveform and its volume at that particular millisecond of time. Okay? Now, this is a very simple representation. So here's another one. So this is a uh, volume. Or amplitude, and this is time. And this is more of what it looks like. So we've got this line here, the black line. That's what the waveform looks like in reality when you're just hearing it. Like, say, this is a an acoustic guitar. Excuse me, and somebody's playing that for you, and you're listening to it. 
this is what this this is what each one of these samples actually looks like. So they're little rectangles, right? Because it's just ones and zeros. It's not a curved line. Now this is very low resolution right here, so that would sound really bad. And and here we go. So this is a third example. And let me make this a little smaller so I can fit the whole page into this. There we go. So if this is the analog wave, right? And it's this black line. And notice it's the same for all of these. And if samples were taken at each one of these points during the waveform, and this is not a lot of samples, this is what it would look like. That doesn't look like a curved line at all, right? It, it, it doesn't. It looks like a, sky, a city skyline. Now, this is a, these are more samples taken per second. And you see it's starting to look a little bit more like a curved line. And then this one here, where there's many samples taken per second, you're starting to see that it, it <clears throat> excuse me, takes on many more of the characteristics of a curved line. But if you zoom in, you could see that it's really an illusion. It's still got those rectangular shapes. But what happens is that it's going by so fast that it gives the illusion to your ears that it's smooth. So each one of these up and down lines, those are that's representing samples taken at the different amplitudes of this wave. So the more samples per second, right, it makes the digital representation of the analog sound wave more accurate and the waveform appears to look smoother with less of this, what, what they're calling here, stepping. So it looks like a, a staircase, right? A steps up and down, up and down. Less of that here, more of a wave. Now, one way to think of this is to compare this to photography, right? So the resolution of a photograph, if you print it, or even if you look at it, is called DPI, or dots per inch, okay? So this one here is what, if you have a, this is a circle, supposed to be. If it's at 10 dots per inch, you notice here it's got the same kinds of things with the rectangular steps, and it, does, it doesn't really look like a circle. This is 72 dots per inch. It's a little bit smoother, but if we zoom in, we can see that there's still a lot of roughness around the edge, and then this is 300 dots per inch, and that looks much more like a circle. Now, if I were to um, make that really tiny, right now those look like three circles, right? Because we're, we're far away. But if we get closer in and take a, a, you know, a, a really critical look, you can see that it's not. So... Now, remember I said 44,100 samples per second is what we're used to hearing in CD uh, audio, right? That's important to realize, and I'll tell you why. So one of the most important rules concerning these samples or sampling is called the Nyquist theorem. And this theorem states that the highest frequency that can be represented accurately is one half of the sampling rate. So the highest frequency, basically the highest frequency you can hear is one half the sample rate. So that if your sample rate is 20,000 samples per second, you can only hear up to 10,000 hertz. If your sample rate is 1,000 samples per second, you can only hear a frequency up to uh, 500 hertz. So the Nyquist rate specifies the minimum sampling rate that fully describes a given signal. In other words, a sampling rate that enables the signal's accurate reconstruction from the samples. So a sample rate that enables the signal to be accurately reconstructed in digital audio by individual samples, okay? 
In reality, the sampling rate required to reconstruct the original signal must be somewhat higher than the Nyquist rate because of something called quantization errors or aliasing introduced by the sampling process. So what is aliasing? I didn't put that on here, but aliasing is a type of artifact in digital audio when the original analog signif- signal gets misidentified by the digital system. So if we take an analog signal and record it into our DAW, the system reconstructs it digitally based upon the sample rate. Sometimes the digital reconstruction is not an exact copy of the analog one, and we end up with some errors. So if, we're, if humans can hear, remember that for a second, we end up with some errors. So if humans can hear frequencies in the range of 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, you would think that the sampling frequency would be twice, two times 20,000 or 40,000, right? So in other words, if the highest frequency that humans can hear is 20,000 hertz, we have to multiply that by two to get the sampling rate you need to reproduce all those frequencies. And 20,000 times two is 40,000. But CD audio is 44,100. They give you that extra 4,100 to account for some of these quantizing and aliasing errors. That's the best, the simplest way that I can do it. They oversample beyond what people can hear to give you some extra, like, headroom to account for errors. That's the simplest way that I can put it. All right? Now, the other bit of... The other bit, (laughs) the other... uh, facet of this is bit depth. So analog audio is a continuous wave with an effectively an infinite number of possible amplitude values. So an infinite number of volumes, typically, although, you know, like 180 or 190 decibels is pretty much the loudest sound that you can have given the physics. And if you were to hear something at 180 decibels, it would kill you. Um, Yeah. So, but effectively, if you've got something that goes, let's say, from 1 to 10, and and 10 is your loudest volume, and 0, well, let's say 0 to 10, 0 is no volume, and 10 is the the highest volume. In analog audio, there's an infinite number of divisions of that 1 to 10, right? it's It's just a smooth line from 1 to 10, and you could have... There's no, like, you could have definite subdivisions of that 10, but the space between all those numbers is infinite, right? There's no quantizing and there's no stepping. It's just an infinite number of amplitude or volume levels. But when we're measuring a wave in digital audios, we need to define the wave's amplitude as a finite value each time we sample it. So remember we, I said earlier that every sample captures uh, the wave, audio wave, at a particular amplitude that happening happening at that instant, right? So the audio bit depths determines the number of possible amplitude values or audio volume values we can record for each sample. The most common audio bit depths are 16-bit, 24-bit, and 32-bit. Each one is a binary term representing a number of possible values. So 16-bit audio, which is what's on CD, has 65,000 levels of volume. 24-bit video uh, audio, which is what we're using now pretty much, is 16 million. So remember, this is eight bits more, but notice it's many, many, it's not, it's not eight times 65,000. It's, you know, it's like logarithmic or trigonal. It's, it's that kind of, uh, of, of math, but 16 million val, like almost 17 million values and 32 bit, which is not used too much right now because it's, um, it's, it's, up until like now computers are plenty powerful to use 32 bit but up until the past few years you'd have to have a really powerful computer 
to process 32-bit audio, but it's four, uh, it's, it's four billion <laughs> values. So with higher audio bit depth and therefore a higher resolution, more amplitude or volume values are available for us to record. As a result, the continuous analog wave's exact volume is closer to an available value when sampled. Therefore, a digital approximation of the amplitude becomes closer to the original fluid analog wave. So one way to think of that is, you know, 16-bit might have one, two, three, four, five, six levels. 24 bit might have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 20, 20 values. And then 32 bit might have like, you know, 100 values between zero and full volume, right? So that's an easy, simple way to think about it, right? So uh, a sample rate is the number of snapshots per second, and bit depth has to do with the number of possible volumes that can be captured by those samples. Let me say that one more time. Sample rate is the number of uh, individual snapshots at a particular amplitude or a particular volume that are captured per second. And bit depth is the resolution of the amplitude. How many values of, of volume are there and let's say that, um, you know, your, your, your audio is here, but you've got this step because you're in 8-bit and this step. Well, it's going to go down here and you're going to have that much volume difference between rea reality and what the computer captures, right? If you're in 24-bit, let's say your volume is here and the step is, you know, right there, it's much closer to the actual value. So it can capture something that's much closer to what you're actually really hearing. And you have to realize that this stuff is going by so fast, 44,000 samples per second, right? And that's like an incredible number of sounds to have, you know, values to happen. Now, there is a hundred, the highest uh, sample rate that we currently use is 192,000 samples per second. So that means there's 192,000 snapshots. It takes up a lot of data, a lot of data. And um, I would say that there are things that are recorded at a very high sample rate like that because you can capture more of the nuance and then it gets downsampled to the consumer grade. Now, why did they pick 16-bit and 44.1? Why was that picked? Okay, so let's go back to the 1980s. So when CDs came, you know, when they first decided to release digital audio, they decided on the compact disc. And at that time, the amount of data that you could fit on a compact disc was, was it like 750 megabytes or something like that? Right, and that equated out to about 50 minutes of stereo audio at 16-bit 44.1 so that you could fit, an or maybe an hour, so you could fit an entire album because you realize that the CD, when they made CDs, the record industry experienced an incredible boom because people like me were buying all my albums again on CD. And um, they had to make it economically viable with the technology that they had. So you could fit in, in most cases, you could fit one album on a compact disc at 1644. And that they thought that that sounded good enough because it's true that if you've got a very expensive turntable and a very expensive amplifier and great speakers, and you've got a great needle on that turntable, and you've got virgin vinyl that's, you know, got, you know, the highest quality vinyl, that the sound produced from that will destroy digital audio. It sounds so much better. But for most people using consumer, you know, a, a back then $400, $500 stereo system with a CD player and a tuner and a cassette deck, right? 
you know, a CD sounds much better than like a cheap turntable with a crappy needle and, and crappy speakers. Much better. So it, it, things were done for the consumer. All right. So that's basically as far as I teach digital audio theory in this class. You're not going to be um, examined on it, but you should be exposed to it. Any questions on that? Okay, I'll ask you a question. If something is sampled at 22,000 samples per second, what would be the highest audio frequency you could hear? 22,000. Remember the Nyquist theory? Went over that? It says that the highest frequency you can hear is half of the sample rate. So if it's 22,000, you can just type it in. You don't have to open your mouth if you're embarrassed and don't want to do math in front of everybody else. Anyone? 11, yes, Andrew, exactly. Perfect. Thank you. 11,000. So let's experience that. All right, so this is the, um, oh, hold on. This is, you recognize this from this week's assignment. This is one of the acoustic guitar parts. So that's 24-bit uh, at 44. It's originally was at 48, but it's been downsampled to 44 for this uh, project for this um, example. Now, Pro Tools comes with a plugin called Lo-Fi, and you would find that in the Harmonic, right, Lo-Fi. And this session is up on uh, the class materials if you want to look at it. So Lo-Fi gives us an opportunity to check some of this stuff out, right? So I'm playing this, and I'm, I've just got this looped. So this is at full resolution, 24 bits, full sample rate, right? Okay, so I'm going to play that, and as I play it, I'm going to turn the sample rate down. And what do you think is going to happen as I turn the sample rate down when you're listening? What are you going to hear? What's going to happen to the audio? Anybody venture a guess? Okay, the lower the sample rate, right, that means less high frequencies are captured. So what you just venture a guess as to what's going to happen to the audio when you're listening to it. It's going to get duller. Yeah, you're going to lose the high frequencies. That's what we expect. Let's take a listen and uh, see if that's reality. So that's 33. Now, I don't know if you're going to be able to hear this over Zoom. Here on my headphones, I can definitely hear that there's a little bit less high frequencies. So this, when this is on up here, that means it's bypassed. And then when I click like that, you'll be, I just go back and forth without talking. So it will start off bypassed. So do you hear the finger squeak? It's very high pitched. You know how it's duller, the, the finger squeak? Let me actually, this is really annoying, I, and I apologize for that in advance. But let me just circle this. Because it has that the squeak, which is very high frequencies, right? Okay. It's darker. You can definitely hear that. It's darker. Let's go back up. Let's do this. I'll type in a number. So let's go. So it's 44. Let's go to 40,000. No, it doesn't let me do that. Go to 30. Okay. Go down to 22. Bypass. 
Right, so you can definitely hear that now. So that means it's only going up to 11,025 hertz, what you're hearing. All right, so now 14,000. 11,000. 7,300. you can also hear with the lower sampling rate, you can start to hear that there's some stepping going on uh, where the, the audio doesn't sound very smooth. Right? You hear some of those? It almost sounds like there's these clangorous tones being added to the, to the sound. So let's go back up to full volume to full uh, resolution. And now let's turn the bit depth down. So remember, these are the bit depth is the resolution of the amplitude, uh, how many levels of amplitude that the waveform can capture. All right? So 24 bits is full. So this is CD quality right now. Bypassed. It's very subtle, but you can definitely hear, I can definitely hear a difference in the dynamics and the sound quality on just on my headphones. I, it's probably not... Um, translating out over Zoom that well, but it, um, you know, I'm capturing this on my uh, recorder over there, so it'll probably sound better on YouTube. But let's go down to 12 bits. Bypassed. Now, notice it doesn't, it doesn't affect the squeaks. You can still hear the squeaks of my fingers on the strings. But it sounds more open with, the, with, it, um, with it at full, full depth. There's a sort of a, a clarity to it that uh, 12 bits doesn't have. And what's really interesting is that a lot of, um, a lot of big hit songs that used samplers in the eight, 90s all the Akai samplers were 12 bit and they were being, you know, when they recorded that onto C into onto tape and then made that onto a CD, that 12 bits got an extra six bit or four bits added to the dynamic range that basically were zeros. It didn't really do anything. It's just an interesting concept. So now as I get down below 12 bits, you're really going to start to hear a difference in the sound. There's a lot of noise in the sound now. And if I bring the sample rate down also. Right, if I turn the anti-aliasing up, that sort of fixes some of the errors. But if I leave that down here, Right, it doesn't sound recognizable. So that's the effect of that. This is actually the best presentation of this that I put together, I think. It just It's really good to like really, you know, I've been teaching this for a decade, but it's always good to just go over it and think about it. I've been thinking about it all week, or like what a better way to present this material would be, especially online. All right, so that's that. <laughs> All right. Now, the next thing I want to talk about before we get into mixing to the rest of the mixing bit is uh, signal flow. OK. Let me uh, close this session. And 
mentioned, uh, I've got these PDFs that I put together. And these are also up on, oops, on our OneDrive. Signal flow explained. So all these are up there. All right. So signal flow. Let's start off analog, okay? With stuff that you know. There we go. All right. So we're going to go... Instead of going from right left to right, we're going to go backwards. We're going to go from right to left. And, and, and the reason for that is the way that uh, manufacturers have set up the flow out of a guitar. And I'm using a guitar as an example here to talk about signal flow. All right, so this is an electric guitar, as you all know, and it's a you know, Fender Stratocaster. Um, and then this is a electric guitar amp. It's a Fender Deluxe Reverb. And so the sound source is the guitar. So when you play the guitar, you either use a plectrum or your fingers or your thumb or something to strike the strings and the strings start vibrating. Now... the guitar string's vibration is turned into electrical energy by the pickup. A pickup is a transducer. A transducer converts one type of energy to another. So on the guitar, the Stratocaster has one... Oh, sorry, hold on. There we go. It has one, two, three pickups. Right, And each one of these pickups have six magnetic poles, and these poles are placed uh, below each string. And then it's got wires wrapped around that, and it creates a ma you know, like a, a, a magnet of the whole thing, the metal poles. And you know, they've got this is a single coil, which means that there's just one wrapping of wire around here. I could I should have gotten a pickup. I, I, I sh maybe I'll do that next week because I'll be talking about microphones next week. And a pickup is a, a microphone. You could talk into it and it'll, it'll hear it. Uh, some pickups become microphonic. And in some cases, that creates a sound that's desirable. In other cases, it's not because it starts to feedback. So this, this, so this is a microphone is a transducer. And a transducer is simply something that converts one type of energy to another. So the strings are vibrating. That vibration gets turned into electrical energy by these pickups. And it's got a very, very low output. Like you won't even get a shock from it. It's such a low output of electricity. All right. And then that energy gets, the, the, the electrical signal gets fed to this right here. And you hook up a patch cable. Something that looks like this on to, plugs right into the guitar. And then that gets plugged in. The cable gets plugged into an input on the amplifier. Now, the amplifier has several parts, right? An amplifier does what the name implies. It amplifies or increases the amplitude, volume, of an electrical signal from the guitar. And then this is routed to a speaker. And a speaker is also a transducer. It takes electrical energy and changes it back into vibrations or sound. Now, the signal that comes from the guitar has a very low... It's very low in power. So the amplifier has a couple of stages. It has a pre-amplifier stage, which takes the low output of the guitar and brings the level up enough so that it can drive the second part of the guitar amplifier, which is the power amplifier. And then the power amplifier feeds the speakers. And then the speakers do the reverse of what the microphone does, 
right? It takes the electrical energy and changes it into vibrations and shoots it out into the atmosphere or the space. Now, you could hook up a speaker and it can be used as a microphone as well, right? Just like a pickup can be used as a microphone, a speaker can be used as a microphone. And in fact, uh, there's plenty of recorded music where a producer has taken like a big 15-inch speaker and stuck it right in front of a bass drum to get more low-end information out of it, right? So that's way beyond what we, we teach, but a speaker is a transducer. So the way the signal flows here is player hits the string, frets a note, right? And that length of string creates a pitch, which is vibrating at a certain number of, you know, cycles per second and then that electrical that that vibration goes is pick is uh excites the pickup the pickup is a transducer a microphone of sorts changes the vibration into electrical energy the electrical energy comes out of this quarter inch jack and a cable carries it to the input or the preamplifier of the of the guitar amplifier that signal which is very low in in energy or very low in power gets brought up to a level that can drive the power amplifier, and the power amplifier is sends the signal, that electrical signal, back to the speakers where it gets converted back into vibrations. And, you know, speakers vibrate when you look at them. I showed something last week, I believe, uh, of speakers vibrating. Okay, so that's one. Now, the next thing is signal, like when we, in, um, in Pro Tools, when we add our MIDI instruments, we're putting it into the inserts column, right? So we're inserting an instrument into the signal path. And an easy way to look at, to, to, to think about that is to think about what a guitar player does. So this is... And this is the reason why I've got it going from uh, right to left is that this is the way that uh, effects pedals are set up, <laughs> right? The input is on the right and the output is on the left. Uh, so if I show you this, right, this is a, a boost pedal. As it's looking at me, the input is on this side, which is my right, and the output is on this side, which is my left, right? So you plug the guitar cable into here, and then this side goes to the amplifier. Oh, let me just plug this back in. I need it for my demonstration. <laughs> okay, so the signal flow here is the same source as before with the vibrations and the trans the micro the pickups coming out of here, turning it into electricity. The electrical signal comes out of here, and all of these effects for this particular example is are inserted into the signal path, right? They're basically just you know daisy chained one into the other, and each one of these things will affect the timbre. So we're gonna learn about this more inside of Pro Tools a little bit today, definitely for sure a little bit today, but more over the next couple of weeks. So, and then out of the last effect in the signal chain, it goes into the preamplifier of the amp, of the guitar amp. That powers, brings up the signal to a level that can drive the power amp. And then the power amp um, feeds that signal into the speakers and the speakers are transducer that do the reverse job that the pickups did. They change that uh, electrical energy into vibrations and shoot it out into the space. In the DAW, the equivalent of this, uh, let me just do this. And let's get this so that you guys can see it a little better. Okay. So the source, oh, that's, I'm blocking that. Jeez. Here we go. The source is the audio file or a software virtual instrument like Expand2 or Boom, then the DAW plugin inserts. So after the audio file or after the software VI, you could plug in an equalizer or something like compression or a bunch or distortion, a bunch of different things. And then 
that gets through what's called the master bus out to the speakers or your headphones. So that's the DAW equivalent of this signal path. The guitar is replaced by, let's say, an audio file or expand. And these get replaced by plug-in inserts in the insert column. And I'm going to do this all in Pro Tools, so don't worry about that. And then after that, it gets sent to the master bus where all of the different tracks are summed together. And that gets sent to the output or, which in your case, most likely headphones or if you have speakers or you listen on your laptop speakers. Track types. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna um, track types are for later. Let's go to DAW simple signal flow. So this is Pro Tools, and this is any DAW has the same thing. So our, we're gonna go back now from left to right, since that's how we're all used to reading. So audio track, right, and it goes into the audio channel. Now we haven't looked at a mixer yet, but that's in Pro Tools, and it goes through the, this entire path, right? And it's got inserts up here and then a volume control and then panning controls. And that output goes to the master bus and then there could be inserts in the master bus. And from the master bus, it goes maybe to an audio interface that gets hooked up to speakers or to your headphones in the uh, headphone jack. Give me one second, I'm gonna sneeze, hold on. Excuse me. Now, from multiple tracks, every let's say every one of these tracks has an audio file that plays through it. All of these tracks get routed to the master bus, the final stage. And we haven't used a master bus yet, but that they all get summed together. That means the volume of all of those tracks gets added together. Remember, this is digital audio, so it's numbers. It gets added together, and if it gets above a certain amount, it's going to start distorting. So that's all, then that's called summing. It sums together, and it goes out to the speakers. Now, there's something called um, an AUGS track, and we're not, we might not get into this today. We might, get into, we might get into it today. Let's just see how much time we've got. So we've got our audio track, goes through the audio channel, and goes to the master bus. And then there's something called sends. And I told you guys to hide that. We're going to start looking at that again, so we'll make that active. And that sends has a little little fader on it, and it sends a copy of the audio to something called an auxiliary track or an aux track. And in that aux track, you could have an insert like reverb. And then you send a copy of the audio from your original track to this aux track, and it gets blended in with the reverb, and the two of these signals gets bussed together to the master bus and to the speakers. And uh, that's very confusing, but when I show it to you, it will be less confusing. But that's basically what happens. You, When you're doing reverb or echo, typically you have an aux track with that reverb or echo plugged into it or delay. And you send a copy of the audio from the original track to this aux track. And then the output of the aux track gets mixed together with the output of the original track. And that all gets sent to the sent it to the master bus, right? Or it all goes to the master bus where it gets summed together and then the output to your speakers or your headphones. Now, there's something to remember that the source of the audio, and this is really important when you're recording audio, but remember last week when we started working on the acoustic guitar tune, uh, the that the, the assignment, that I used something called clip-based gain because the sum of all the audio coming out was distorting. It was going into the red. I didn't turn the volume on the faders down. I turned the volume of the audio tracks down. 
because those audio tracks were recorded a little bit too hot so that when they summed together, right, it was causing congestion. And that congestion because it caused distortion. So it's really good. And the reason why is that you're turning the volume down before it goes through the channel strip. So I'm going to show you that here in this little demonstration. So I just need to plug my guitar in. Give me one second. And let me... Uh, Unmute these channels. Okay, so I've got... Um, here, let me just show you this. This is a Yamaha silent guitar, right? So basically, this is a nylon string guitar. And it's got a... On the bridge here, it's got called, something called a piezo pickup. Piezo or something like that. And then that just picks up the sound and it comes... It's the same thing, right? The, the sound comes out of the back into this cable. And then that cable is plugged into this and I'm not going to use this but it's then right so the, this cable comes from the guitar to the input of this little pedal from the in, output of this pedal to the input of this pedal and then from the input of this pedal ah, I plug things in backwards hold on one second I'm surprised that's even working I unplugged this to show you, and then I hastily plugged it back in. All right, so when I play the guitar, um, let me turn off that reverb. So you basically just hear, uh, so the guitar, these are off, this is off. So the guitar is going from here into here, and this is a channel strip, just like in Pro Tools, uh, right here. And I've got this set up this is set up into different sections. So this is your input gain. This don't worry about these red ones, but this is a little tone control, an equalist, an equalizer. This is your pan, whether something's on the left or something's on the right or something's in the center, just like in Pro Tools. And this is the level. So this is like the volume slider on Pro Tools channel. That and then that gets sent to the main output fader here. All right, and I've got everything set right now at what's called unity gain. So that means that the signal coming out of the guitar is this is not. There's no gain added to it. There's nothing. It's just I'm very uncomfortable here. There's not enough room to play. Oh my goodness! All right. <laughs> so you could see that it's a very clean sound. And if I turn this fader up, it's going to get louder, right? If I turn this up, it's not a fader, but it's a knob. And you'll see it'll get louder, but it won't distort at all. I could turn this all the way up. And notice that the level is getting really high here, but it's not going into the red. But it still sounds very clean this mic a little closer to me too right it still sounds pretty clean it shouldn't be distorting all right let me turn this back down and now this is a boost this will add volume to the input right so this will take the signal and I've got it set. Let's, let's do this. Let me go back here and without the boost. Now I've got it set now so that it's a little softer, but you can hear already that it's starting to get a little crunchy. So if I bring the volume up here, let's go to like to, uh, 3 o'clock. You can hear that it's starting to get crunchy. 
But notice it's not red here, right? If, 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 in other words, you would think that if with that sound that it would be distorting here by going into the red. No, what's happening is that the input stage is being overdriven. Right? And if I turn it up all the way. Now, additionally, if I turn the gain here up, it will distort even more. And you'll notice that it still won't be in the red over here. Whoops, let me bring this down. Still not in the red. No matter how much I turn this down, right? You're still getting that distortion. That's not in the red at all. You would think that with that kind of sound, it would be all in the red. But what's happening is I'm over, I'm, I'm sending too much level into this channel strip and it's distorting. And that's, the, that's what's happening in Pro Tools when those audio files are too hot. So if you go into an EQ or if you go into a compressor with too hot of a signal, you might get, it doesn't, it's, it's not as efficient. It doesn't work as well, the plugins. And also it'll cause distortion that you can't really get rid of just by turning the volume down. So that's one reason why gain staging is important. Now, that being said, if you're working with 32-bit audio or some high-resolution um, plugins, they can guard against that. They have more headroom, but a lot of plugins don't, and it, can, it results in a bad sound. And actually, um, uh, the, John Lennon made great use of this technique on the song Revolution. He plugged his guitar directly into one channel of the um, red desks that they had, and they took the output of, and he turned that gain all the way up, and they took the output of that and plugged it into another channel, turned the gain all the way up on that. So basically, it would be like plugging into this pedal, turning the gain all the way up, and then turning the gain all the way up here. And right? So that's how we got that distorted sound, right? Anyway, that's... Uh, that's just a little tangential side side story. All right, so now I've I've I'm turning this off, and I'm bringing this back down to Unity Gang, and see how much louder and still clean and clear. Now I could turn this up and distort it, but then I'd hurt be hurting your, our ears, so I'm not going to do that. Okay, so that's uh, why gain staging is really important, you know. Great. I'm just putting things away. Give me one second. <laughs> All right, so um, I think that the demonstration is, it makes it much more clear than me theoretically talking about it, right? So basically, the audio file is the starting point of the sound in Pro Tools. So I'm going to open up our, um, our stem mix that I was on last week, and we are going to spend the next 45 minutes learning some new techniques. And I will stay off camera for this. <laughs> uh, any questions so far? Everything crystal clear? I could give you an exam on it right now and you'd all get a 99 or 100. <laughs> I don't think I would get a 99 or 100. It's a lot, it's a lot of material. to You know, it's a lot of stuff. Uh, you, I won't be testing you on it. Don't worry about it. But you should read that, uh, that document I put up again and, and just understand the basic concept. Okay, so we've uh, let's just play this again and get familiar with it. So this is just with working on balancing volumes and panning. It sounds good, right? 
So remember I said last week that mixing, a lot of mixing is volume dependent, just working on different volume things. Now let me get back in the photo here so I can talk to you directly, right? And so all we did last week at this point was to get our gain stage correct and balance all of our instruments. You know, we made some choices when we had multiple microphones, some microphones we got rid of, some microphones were too loud. We brought them down to balance the, like, the three microphone sections, and then we did some panning to set up a sound stage. And it sounds good the way it is. Now, let me just show you something here. Uh, there's another window in Pro Tools called the mixing window. I, don't, I typically don't teach this, but this is, um, and this is supposed to be like a, well, it is. It's a graphic representation of uh, uh, like an analog console you'd find in a studio. And basically what I've got here, uh, you know, th this, this, it's a similar to this, except that this has... Uh, tone controls here, and instead of inserts, it's got um, augs sends here, two of them, and it doesn't have faders. It's got knobs because it's it's you know it's an inexpensive mixer. You would pr probably have seen something like this in your church or at you know at gigs that people do. Although nowadays people have digital mixers that they control with iPads at gigs, which I I have a cheap one that I use for my synths uh, that works really well, but. I prefer the, this hands-on approach with mixing. All right, so uh, so you know this audio file comes through here, like I said before, and it goes down and through the master bus. Now there is no master bus, so I'm going to add a master bus track right now, and that's going to give us an opportunity to instead of looking at this meter up here to actually see numbers to give us a, a number to shoot for when we're mixing. So I'm going to select the track on the bottom, right? And then I'm going to do Command, Shift, N, like Nancy. Um, you know, it might be... Actually, give me one second here. Let me uh, just switch out cameras so that I can get the side view so you could see my... Um, I have one too few, whoops, excuse me, one too few uh, <laughs> camera inputs on my switcher. All right, so uh, this the camera for the mixer is no longer hooked into the system. All right, so um, I'm going to do Command, Shift, N, right? And then that's going to get me this dialog here, and uh, I'm going to call this Master. Oh, I'm not going to call that anything. I'm going to select a stereo master fader. And make sure that, yeah, and you want to select create one. <laughs> make sure you select stereo, all right? Master fader. Don't worry about this. And the name is master. That's fine. And we've got it. Uh, why didn't it do it? Come on, Pro Tools. I'm sick of you. Stereo, Master Fader, Create. And now it's down at the bottom. And typically for myself, with, with stuff down at the bottom here, I typically turn the color off. But you, you don't have to do that, just as long as what I'm going to show you today, all these new tracks are going to be at um, the, same, the same level. So when I play this now... You see that this is the level of the output up here. So one thing is that this fader, you can make it bigger by making the track bigger, right? So it's a lot easier to see. Now, let me just show, zoom in on this. And you'll see that as the audio wave goes up and down here, the green one, there's going to be an amber line here. That's the peak, and it'll hold the peak for a couple of seconds. See the amber line up here? That's the peak. And then, now, that still doesn't give you anything more than a color, right? Green is lower, amber is getting to be at, at a good level, and then when it's in the red, it's too much. But what you can do is you can click right here on the insert. And if you go to um, Avid or you just go up to... Uh, 
EQ, right? There's something called the EQ3 seven band stereo. EQ3 seven band stereo. Put that in. This is an e equalizer. It's a tone shaping device. It's, I'm going to turn all of these off right here, but don't, don't worry about this right now. What this does, it's very transparent, so it's not going to change the sound. But if we look right here, it's got a meter with numbers on it. Right? And what I want you to do is when you're setting your stuff up, and actually I'm going to drag this, click and drag this all the way down to the bottom here. So it's the last thing in the chain. I, I want you to mix so that the loudest volume in your track peaks at minus six and most of the volume is closer to minus 10. So you see that? I'm just a little bit below minus six. That's fine. But most of the sound on this track is around minus 10. Yeah, it gets a little softer here, no problem. That's dynamics, right? Now, that went above minus six, right? Like one hit like that, that's, that's, gonna, that's fine. You know, but don't have a steady diet of living above minus six on your peaks. So, whoops, excuse me. So we can use that to give us numbers, data, you know, something to shoot for that's like clean and accurate, right? We can re reproduce that every time as opposed to just looking at this fader up here, which, you know, gives you a general idea, but is not really that helpful. Now, on my desk, I have this right here. And what I typically do is I put a plug-in in the master fader that act... I hope that this is going to activate it because I haven't had it on in a couple days. Um, yeah. And so I can see everything... I have my level, and then I've got my EQ, like my frequency spectrum there. So I'm always working with that on. Uh, yeah, and that's that. So I, I, I just keep that on. You don't have to get anything like that. That's really a way beyond. But it is, I do, I'm, I'm, work, I'm teaching you to work the way I work. So I'm not teaching you to work a way that's like theoretical. It's, it's the way I work, you know, and it's the best way to keep a good gain structure. So that's the first thing. You've got a master f stereo master fader. It's at the bottom of your session. And the reason it's at the bottom of your session has to do with um, the way that a mixer was set up. So remember with this thing here, right? The master fader is all the way over on the left. I mean, on the right, all the way over on the right. So if you're at the bottom here, when we call up the mixing window, The master fader is all the way on the right, just like it is on a mixing console. So it 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 makes sense, you know, for any engineer would look at that and they'd know exactly what to do because that's the way that they if they've worked on a big console, that's what they've done. So you know, I think it's 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 good to emulate that practice, right? There's a reason why that works. Most people are right-handed, so that's you know they reach over with their right hand and, and move the fader. Right. If you're left-handed, well, they don't. It's not. It's not like having a left-handed guitar. I guess you could turn the the console upside down, or you could just get used to working with your right hand. Um, it's not fair, but that's just the way it is. A lot of life isn't fair. Okay. So that's the first thing. Master fader at the bottom. Put your EQ three seven band. Now, let me show you another little trick here. If you want to keep this open to work with while you're doing other things, if and this is hard when you've got a laptop, right? But I've got big screens, so I if you this red button on the upper right-hand side is called the target button. If you click on that, it becomes gray. That will always remain visible, and then you can just tuck it down into the corner somewhere. So I could put it like that. Oh, well, actually, I can't do that. Right? It still takes up a lot of room. Now, if you're industrious, there are... Um, Ch -ch 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 
you know, there are other other ways to do this. Let me just see. Do I have? Uh, no, I do not have there. I used to have, uh, I don't know why I don't have it in here, but uh, there are free um, metering plugins that you can get. Right, that are have all this other stuff on it. You don't really need that, but there are free ones that you can get that are smaller than this that won't take up so much screen space. But this is what we've got in Pro Tools right now, and so it's it's a good way. But we I've made sure that everything is at minus six, the loudest. So I'm gonna just close that down for now. But as I'm working, I'm going to uh, keep keep at it. Okay. In other words, I'll, I'll double check every once in a while. Now, as I'm listening to this, it occurs to me that, right, that's the, the bassy part of the guitar case. So let's, now, it's, it, I could use a little bit more, more girth because there's, there's no bass guitar in this track. Okay, so let me think about this for a second. All right, I'm going to come back to that. Let me listen to this harmonica. So there, that harmonica is playing the melody. Right. And as such, there's frequencies in there that I don't need. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert and let me make this bigger and zoom in what, an EQ. So you can either go to EQ. I've got a lot of crap in here. But if you go to Avid, you could just put in EQ three one band. And when I teach how to EQ something, remember that what an EQ does is it's frequency dependent volume control. So depending upon the pitch or the harmonic in a sound, an EQ will change that particular harmonic or that particular frequency. So the easiest way to learn that, to start to learn that, is to use this one band EQ, the EQ3 one band, and there are two settings on it that I'm going to show you. One is called a low pass filter, which turns down or attenuates the volumes of the higher frequencies, or a high pass filter, which turns down or attenuates the frequencies, the lower frequencies. And let's go back here. And what I've, I've got this up. And then what I'm going to do for right now is I'm going to put a, like a metering plug in in here so you can see this. And let's do, um, frequency where that's big. All right. So I'm just going to, I'm soloing the, the harp. Now, if I look at this, right. So from left to right is low pitch to high pitch. And from bottom to top is soft to loud. So you'll notice here at like these really low frequencies here, it's very loud. You can't hear that, but that's in there. We don't need to have all any of that. We probably, you know, around here, this says 125. That's probably good. So what we can do to change that is we can go right here to our EQ. And then over here, this left button, see how it's an up curve, like an up dog leg? That's a, called a high pass filter. So it cuts down the volume of the low frequencies and lets the high frequencies go through unaffected. So if I click on that, you're going to see this graph change. And it's going to be very steep. Now, 
over here, we've got two controls. We've got the Q, and that's not some creepy conspiracy theory, nor is it Quincy Jones, but it's the, on this particular filter, it's, it's how steep this slope is. So if I turn this to the left, it, the angle here is going to get a little more gentle. And this is for every octave lower that you get in pitch, the volume goes down six decibels. So if you go down one octave, all those frequencies get turned down by six decibels. If you go two octaves, it gets turned down by 12 decibels. And if you go three octaves, it gets down, turned down by um, 18 decibels. So we can just do this gentle slope for right now. And this is the frequency. So notice that it's set at 1K, and there's a bit of a curve so that 1K is actually attenuated, 1,000 hertz, and then it slopes up to full frequency up here, and then it gently goes down to no volume below 100 hertz. That's too high a frequency. So we can click and drag this to the left, and you see that that thing's moving, right? Or we can click here and drag the ball. So now, I'm attenuating all these frequencies, and let's look at this graph again. See, look how much softer those are, right? That's the yellow. This is the original one. This is how loud these low frequencies were. Bypassed. It's not audible to you that the sound has changed. Because we can't hear these frequencies anyway. But all that mud will affect like the low strings on the guitar, the low notes on that uh, guitar case. So it's best to clean that up right here. So that's the first move you're going to make is putting in a high pass filter on the harmonica, right? And cleaning that up. And let me just show you what I've done here. I'm going to take a screenshot of this and pop it in. And notice that it tells you right here, harp, cascade, tells you the name. And then this bypasses it and turns it on just by clicking on that. So I'm going to take a screenshot of this and shoot it in the chat so you can download your first move. So this is the first thing I want you to do for, a, for an effect. Give me a second here to find this. There you go. It's in there if you want to download that. Now, let's make all these the same size. Okay, so let me listen to the, these two guitars here. Now, with this one, right? Let me think about this for a second. Okay, so I'm going to show you something, and you're going to do it the way I show you for this assignment. I'm going to teach you the same thing, but the track ordering is going to be different later on. Just because this is very complex, and I want you to be able to follow where everything is, that I'm going to show you this uh, this way right now, okay? So I'm going to highlight the bottom track of those two purple tracks, and then I'm going to do uh, Command Shift N like Nancy, and that's going to bring up new tracks. And I'm going to do one stereo. You could do this in either mono or stereo, but I'm going to teach you stereo. 
and you're going to put do something called an augs input. All right. So I'll take a screenshot of this. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, I'll take a screenshot of this. And I'll pop this into the chat. Oops. So we can have that. Okay, and then I'm going to name this... Let's see, this is guitar to duplicate, so I'll call this uh, fill guitar, right? Because it's just really doing a fill. And I'm going to call it fill guitar master because it's the master output for the fill guitar. And you could color code this the same as that. And so if, the way to do that very easily is to highlight this one, hold the shift key down, highlight this, and then open this up and you'll see both colors here. Well, you want it to be that purple one. Now, let me just double check something really quickly. Great. A, um, a master, uh, an augs track, an augs track is a track that plays audio that is sent to it from another destination. So it's not like an audio track where you've got the audio file in the track. You can't put an audio file in an AUGS track. You need to take audio from a different track and route it so that it goes through the AUGS track. Okay? So let me show you how to do that. First thing we're going to do is we're going to go up here. And we're going to show sends A through E. And then you'll notice a new column has come down here. Great. So if we look at our track here, we have an input. Oh, also, you need to, sh now we need to have the, uh, if you haven't done this, we need to have the IO set up. I think we did that last week. So this track, this AUGS, track or the guitar fill guitar master has an input and an output we need to set the input to something called a bus and you'll notice when you click on that interface and bus click on this and then you should have a list of different buses pick the first one bus one and two stereo and that's the input now Bus is not like a school bus or a public bus. Bus comes from something called a bus bar. And that's, if you, let me just show you something. If, Okay, so all these, you've probably seen these if you've watched any back uh, old movies, but this is in the old school days when we had analog phones, right? This was the operator. And if you called, she would plug the output of your phone call into somebody else's line. And then that person would be able to hear you. And all of these things are called patch bays and they all have something called a bus bar in them which enables uh, energy to be transferred from one source to the next. So that's where the term bus came from, bus bar. And this is, you know, this was a, uh, a shining example from history. So you see that all the technology in Pro Tools and all, the, all of the DAWs, it, there's a historical precedent for all this stuff, right? So that's why it's good to know that stuff. So we need to set the output of these two two tracks to the input of the augs track so we go here and we set the output to bus oh 
interesting. I can only set mono. All right, I'm going to make, I made a mistake there. We can't do stereo. That doesn't work. I'm going to delete this. I don't know. I don't understand that. That's not, that's not right. Oh, here we go. Okay. Bus, I, I think I did the wrong thing. Bus one and two, stereo. And then here, bus one and two, stereo. So now you've got, oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Ugh, I'm getting confused here. I apologize. Yeah. So, ugh, give me a break. It, okay, let's do this one more time. Maybe I'll get this right this time. I've only been doing this stuff for 20 years. You'd think I'd get it down by now. All right, so you take the output of the first one. You go to bus one and two. You take the output of the second one, and you go to bus one and two. So both of the outputs of these two tracks are routed to the input of this track. Now, if you play this, we should hear sound, right? Nope, we're not hearing sound. Why is that? You could see that the meters are moving, but there's no sound coming out because we have not soloed this track also. Now, what I typically do is tell people to solo safe this track. And the way you do that is, um, oops, excuse me. Is you hold the command key down and click on the letter S. And then the letter S becomes uh, becomes grayed out, right? So that means now if I play that, we can hear it, all right? So what, what this does, which is a great benefit to us, is that anything we put into this master track will affect both of these tracks. So let's say I wanted to make this a little bit... Um, a little bit darker, right? Now, if I put it, that one band EQ in here, and I use this type over here, which is called a low pass filter. Now, this will be very dark. That's too dark because, again, the frequencies, it's, it defaults to 1000. And let's move our slope down. Let's bring this up a little bit more. Right, so that's just making it a little bit smoother and not so spiky. So I like the way that that sounds. Now moving down to our green tracks. Okay, I'm gonna do the same thing with these. I'm gonna highlight the bottom one. Command Shift N, one new stereo, augs input, and this'll be uh, guitar two. And then I will make it the same color as the other one. And I'm going to solo safe this right at the beginning. So hold the command key down and click on the S. And that becomes grayed out, just like that. And then I'm going to set my input and output. Now, notice how this says uh, bus 1 and 2. If you right-click on this, you can rename that. And then that can become, you can rename that uh, fill guitar. I'll show you that next week. Let's just get the buses down first, okay? We'll go over that more. So this one, we're going to have our set our input up, so it'll be the next available bus. And notice that bus 1 and 2 is amber because it's being used. And then the white ones are unused. So I'm going to go to bus 3 and 4. And then I'm going to set the input of this to bus 3 and 4. And this one also to bus 3 and 4. And now the, the, the that guitar should come through here.
right? So. So with this one here, what I think I'd like to do is add a little edge to the sound, all right? So this isn't, so we're just, you know, we're doing uh, insert effects. So edge to the sounds. Well, there's a category in Pro Tools that's called harmonic, right? If we scroll up, harmonic, and in Avid, There's something called Sans Amp, S A N S A M P. Uh, Avid. Oh, come on. Uh, here it is Sans Amp. So this is. Um, an old plugin, but it's still actually very good, and I do still use this. Uh, this this has been in Pro Tools since oh for uh, since at least like two thousand five, and this is a digital recreation of a a a, a plug a pedal for a guitar pedal made by this company Tech Twenty One. Um, actually, I think this might this is the there's a rack mounted version that this is the model of, but they also made guitar pedals that did similar things. So this adds distortion to the sound and it's got a lot of controls and basically what you do is play around with it. So if I play this, that's the sound without it. Now, there's one thing that I want to teach you right, right at the beginning is that the sound coming out should be the same volume as the sound coming in. So if I start turning up these things, right, so that's adding a lot more gain. So you have to take the output level and bring that down. And then the way you test that is you could put that EQ7 in there and just make sure the levels are the same. Or you could play it and bypass it. So I just basically played around. I played around. I turned up the preamp. I turned up the drive. I might turn the low down a little, just so it's not so muddy. And then listen to that in the mix. So when I'm listening now, it seems like the red guitar is too loud. Now, I don't know if I need to bring the red guitar down or bring the green guitar up. I'm just making a note of that right now. I'm aware of that. I'm going to make that decision a little bit further down the line. So I'm going to now take this these three guitars, and they're going to come out of one output. So Command-Shift-N, one new uh, stereo augs input and I'm going to name this uh, GTR1 and I, you could add MSTR master um, you should do the same on each one so I guess I didn't do that for this this should be guitar 2 master or the other word people sometimes use is sub sub master and then I'm going to get these color coded correctly and solo safe, which again is uh, hold the command key down and click on the S. And then I'll set up my input. So the next one is five and six, right? It's it's white, not amber. And then set my these these three tracks, the output to five and six. Now there's a way to do all this at once, but do it manually for this week. All right. And then now um All three of those guitars are coming out of this master track. So now the reason I didn't change the volume on these is because now I could change the volume on all three tracks at the same time with this sub with this submaster, right? 
So if I click and drag this down, right, so you can hear that. It's off. Now, we're mixing, right? So what if I did this thing where we had this, this the red guitar was playing. Um, let me just mute, mute the, not the red guitar, the, the, that slide guitar, the green one. Let's mute them. Right. We're doing an arrangement. So we're ta we, we played all our parts in, and now we're producers. So we're going to take that audio as the basic uh, material to arrange. And I just had an idea. What if we started out with that slide guitar that we've made dirty, and we fade gently in the second guitar over four bars? I didn't play it that way, but we can do that now. So let me show you how to do that. All right, so we've got all of the red guitar coming through this, this track here, right here. So I can use the pencil tool. And I, I recommend starting out the pencil tool with a straight line. And let me just see. I want it to... Two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Right, so what if I fade it in so that it, it comes to full volume where the melody comes in, right? So that's right here. Very simply, let me zoom in. Put my pencil tool here. Click and drag to the right, to the left and go down. So I've got a slope there. Okay, so I went one bar too much, right? So that I can fix that. Just undo with Command Z and go from here. So I made a mistake. It was easy to fix, right? So that, that guitar is too loud. So what I want to do is adjust the volume. So an easy way to do that is to use my grabber tool up there and then go here and just grab this dot and bring it down a little bit. Adjust. And maybe I'm going to bring guitar two down just a little bit here as well. Okay, so, so far we've done tone shaping with the high pass and low pass filter, right? We've, we've routed outputs of, tr of same, similar tracks to one, one uh, like master output. We've done that with the green guitar tracks and the red guitar tracks. And additionally, we affected the green guitar track and made distorted it a little bit using that Sans Amp plugin. And we just added a little grunge to it. There's nothing wrong with that. That adds a lot of energy. Basically, what you're doing is you're adding and overdriving some of the higher harmonics uh, of the sound. And that's what's sort of giving you that overdriven sound. Um, and then we did that volume swell at the beginning now let's see about let's let's listen to the percussion track a little bit and um let's see if this how that's doing now at the beginning here what happens if i turn off the guitar case at the beginning what, what does that sound like Well, what if I wanted to um, not have the maracas in at the beginning and the sh tambourines in at the beginning? Well, I can certainly, I can either delete or mute that area. So let me show you how to do that. Two, three, four. So maybe I, maybe I wouldn't have them coming in until this area here. So if I just put my playback head right here 
and hold the shift key down and put it here, that means both of these tracks are selected. So I'm holding the shift key down while I'm clicking on both of those tracks, okay? And then if I do a command and the letter E like that, that will put a, a break in the track. That will split that into two different clips, just like that. And then I can highlight this by hold, you know, clicking on this one, holding the shift key down and clicking on this one. And then I can do one of two things. I can either delete. Now, I haven't deleted that audio. It's just not on that um, timeline anymore because if I click and drag back, it's, it's still there, right? So we're just hiding that part of it. Or I can um, do Command and the letter M like Mary. Command and M. And then what you'll see is you'll notice that this track becomes gray. That means it's muted. Okay, so now um, I'm going to make a decision. Anybody have an opinion as to the volume of the claps? Do you think that they're in a good spot? you think they're too loud? Think about it, right? We've changed that beginning now. Listen to how loud the claps are. Anybody want to guess or make a, an educated an educated opinion? Taste? What's your taste? To, yeah, go ahead, Chelsea. I can't hear you. You're uh, muted probably. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay. I was saying that you could probably take it down a little bit. Correct. Maybe a Correct. That, that's exactly right. So there's... Let's do it this way. We've got our gain structure here all fine in the on on these tracks. So this time I'm just going to bring uh, it down here. And now there's two there's two ways you can go about this, right? You could bring the volume of both of those tracks down, or there's two clap tracks. You could mute one of them, right? So that's you you play around with that, and that's your ch artistic choice. I'm not going to tell you what to do for something like that, but what are all the options, right? What are the possibilities? So for right now, I'm just going to go here, and I'm going to bring... This one's at minus... I have this set right now at minus 3, and this one is at minus 2... You know, 3.3 .3 and minus 2.6. So I'm going to bring this down maybe 4 dB. So let's go to minus 7... Somewhere around minus 7. And then this one to about maybe minus five something. Better. All right. Now, this is where it really gets tricky. What if I decided... What if I decided that there's too much activity going on in the low end? Right? This is playing 16th notes. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, tick it, tick it, right? And there's a boop, 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 right? And it's, this is comprised of these higher and lower. If I wanted to clean that up, there's a couple of ways I could do that. But what if I did this? If I did use some of my audio editing skills and notice this is where that hit is. If I just deleted, whoops. This information here, right? So I'm just highlighting and hitting the delete key. And 
I, I can I can do this pretty quickly because I've been doing this for so long. But basically, just you know, getting rid of all those sixteenth notes in the bass area of the of the guitar case drum kit. Now there might be some clicks that we have to clean up with a fade, but we can do that very quickly. And I will show you that. Right. Let me take a listen to this before I go on. So for me, that's cleaner, right? Um, now, there is some click clicking. That's easy to fix. Let me show you how to do that. So you've got all of these things right here. You just click and drag and select them all. And because we have our keyboard focus or key command focus turned on up here, I can just hit the letter F here and it will put tiny little crossfades at the beginning and end of every one of those little clips. See that? Here, let me undo it. Just hit F and it puts in those little fades and that'll clean up that sound. No more clicking. Now, right, remember, this is the first verse, so we're going to build this up. Maybe we'll bring those 16th notes in on the second verse or the end, right? But right at the beginning here, we're starting off simply. So I'm trying to build, break down the arrangements by, by doing some of this editing and volume adjustment and muting some instruments. We've got all this material here. Right. Instead of sitting there with a with, with with a manuscript paper or working in Sibelius or Finale and coming up with this arrangement, we're got we've got all our materials into this session and we're gonna arrange them and we're gonna manipulate them and we're gonna use those material that all those audio files as our raw material for our final product. And part of doing the final product is to create something that tells a compelling story. So story is king. So that's what you're doing in here. You're creating a, 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 a journey, a musical journey. And these are some of the tools that will help you to effectuate that journey. Volume, panning, EQ, just adding some distortion, doing some audio editing, muting some tracks, bringing them in later. You know, doing all sorts of interesting things like this will enhance the quality of what you're doing because, you know, you're, if you've ever looked at the great works of any artist, look at Van Gogh, look at um, uh, even people like Jackson Pollock who were just dancing above a, a canvas spray painting paint off their paintbrush and, you know, dishing paint on or de Kooning or, or my friend Larry Rivers. If you look at any of these great painters, they pay so much attention to the most minute details because that one minute detail in abstraction, in abstract, doesn't really mean that much. But when you put all of those abstract, I mean, minute details, when you put all those minute details together into the aggregate whole, the sum of all those small little decisions adds to the total, the total picture, the total story. And that's a big part of mixing. You'll find that with the great engineers, when, when they're mixing and they're doing stuff, they're doing tiny little changes and they're almost imperceptible to our untrained ears because I'm a composer and a musician and I know how to mix and, uh, you know, and, and record. I'm not an engineer who is... Uh, you know, knows more technical stuff about this than I do. I think of all of this stuff as how does it work musically? You know, when uh, my my friend Ken, who some uh, some of uh, he taught recording studio fundamentals last semester, uh, he's a great audio engineer. He thinks of you know when he EQs something. Oh, there's a little bit too much at 3K. There's a little bit too much at 4.2K. I had to bring that down. I'm listening to that like, well, that harmonic from that fundamental is clashing with the harmonic on another instrument. So I would bring that down because I'm thinking of it in musical terms. Engineers think of it in absolute numer in absolute terms, right? They, they're they very numerical oriented and they have to be because they, they, it, it makes a big difference to them to have finite numbers. Just like when I showed you 
adding that EQ7 band on the master fader gives us a number to shoot for rather than that uh, the fader that's up in the upper right-hand corner that's just sort of like, okay, it's green, amber, and red, but it's not really anything that we can reproduce over and over again, right? It doesn't give us something that's like a finite uh, thing that's defined. So, you know, when you're working with this audio, you're making all these small decisions that hopefully at the end of it will add up to having a compelling narrative with the music. Now, obviously, this is a simple little song and this is your first mix. Well, just do the best you can. Show me that you've learned some, that you're learning some of these techniques, you know, for next week. We're probably going to work on this for two weeks because there's more techniques that we're going to do next week. And next week in class, I'm going to start introducing microphones, different microphone types. And we did, I showed a video about some microphone stuff, um, but I'm going to show you how to record here. And I'm going to show you how to set up your, you know, your little interfaces and stuff. So the, the, we're going to, we keep moving along, right? We're, we're going to keep moving along, but this one piece will teach us a lot about mixing, which is important. If we were in person, We'd be in the studio now. We'd be having a great time recording stuff. You know, it, it always ends up being a lot of fun. And we'd be working on maybe a group project right now where everybody would get a chance to show their musical abilities or lack of thereof. But some people would be the engineers. Some people would be the producers. Some people would be the talent. And we, you know, we'd be doing that. And I'm not even sure I'm going to be doing that in September because the studio is tiny and we're not having... We only have about 10 people that have been doing the work for this class this semester, but we typically have, you know, about 15, between 15 and 20 people that take this class. That's a lot of people to fit into that tiny area. So, but anyway, we're st still going to learn techniques that are very helpful. That's my point. So let's just, let me finish up with a few more things here. So I like this. So I'm just going to quickly go through to the end of this section and do the same thing. And then let me get my fades. I think the last fade was right here. Let me see. Yes. Okay, great. So if I go from here, click and drag all the way over. Whoops, went too far. Whoa, what are you doing, dude? Right here and just hit our letter F. We've got all our fades. So now we've got... So let's do this. Let me... I don't usually teach this right away, but let's do this. So we've got this sound. I want to add some low end to that. So let's go to our um, our EQ37 band, all right? Now, I'm not going to... All you have to know for this week is that the red one turns up, the red one or the amber one turns up the bass. So, right, you can hear there's much more bass now. But you also noticed that, see, the output, this is the input and this is the output is dis the output is distorting because I've added volume 12 decibels of volume to all these low frequencies. So let me put this back here. So you hear see now the input and the output are the same. So let me instead of doing that, let me take this orange one and move it over here. add a little girth and then see how the output is still too much just take the output here and bring it down a little bit so that they're even that's good so you that sound has more a little bit more beef to it and then when we add these two together right it sounds more like a kick drum
Okay, so now let's, I'm just going to do a couple more things. I don't like this here, this harmonica, right? It, it, it gets in the way. That's I'm making a decision. You don't have to make this decision, but I'm making this decision. I'm just going to highlight that and delete it and let the guitars play. Now, right here, the harmonica, is it too soft, too loud, or just right? You need to hear it again or anybody know? It's pretty obvious. It's way too loud, right? That harmonica should fit in with the guitar. So I'm this time... I'm just going to use clip based gain here and just click and drag and bring this down. See that? That fits right in. Okay. So for next week, I'm gonna I'll go over your pro, your projects on Friday. So if you haven't handed it in yet, um, you'll have till tomorrow night to hand it in. It, uh, and I'll, Friday morning when I get up, it'll be the first thing I do uh, once I get back from my dog walk. And I'll go over your projects and give you feedback. Continue on with this piece using some of these techniques today. And, and if you could think of other things that you want to try, just using the stuff that we went over today. Don't try anything new yet. Um, continue on, all right? And then hand it in next week. I'll give you feedback. We're going to learn some more techniques next week, next week, and we'll continue on until we finish mixing this thing. And it's a really good tutorial for mixing because it's all live instruments. There's no MIDI. And um, yeah. So any questions on that? We went over a lot of stuff today, you know, a lot of stuff. But um, I'm hoping that the presentations were clear enough. And fortunately, I'll have... I'll get the YouTube video up uh, either tonight, probably tomorrow morning. Um, yeah, I'll get the video up for you to review uh, everything. And then I'll put one timestamp in. Uh, I'll put a timestamp at the beginning and then a timestamp where this part of the class started so that you could uh, skip all the digital audio stuff and just go right to the mixing if you want to review it. All right, everyone. So um, have a good night. And uh, I will, if there's any questions, please feel free to ask. If not, have a good night and I will catch you all next week. Looking forward to going over your projects. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. Yep. Have Thank you great, so much. Have a great night, everyone.